Yeah, I was going to open this video by saying, hey, what's up, bookworms and chwat goblins? But I thought that might not go over too well uh, with the people who haven't actually read this yet. So, uh, fuck my face. There's no misery so deep as the one you face by yourself. And no nights darker than the ones you spend alone. But you can learn to live with any weight. Your scars grow thick enough they become armor. But if we spend all our lives in darkness, is it any wonder when darkness starts to live in us? There's a difference between those who swim with the flood and those who drown fighting it. And its name is wisdom. Why is pride looked down as evil? If you work hard at something you're not born good at, damn right you should be fucking proud. It's only in fairy tales that everything works out for the best with a magic spell or a prince's kiss. It's only in storybooks some little bastard picks up a sword and wields it like he was born to it. The rest of us? We have to work our asses off. And we might not ever taste triumph, but at least we dared to fail. We stand apart from those cowards whispering the sidelines about how the strong did stumble while never daring to set foot in the ring themselves. Victors are just folk who were never satisfied being vanquished. Because the only thing worse than finishing last is not beginning at all. And fuck finishing last. Aim your heart at the fucking world. And even when there's little you can do, do what little you can. Hey, what's up, bookworms and silver saints? Mike back today to talk a little Jay Kristoff for the first time on the channel. This, of course, is the brand new release of The Empire of the Vampire, the first of a series. I don't know if it's going to be a trilogy. It seems like he's mostly done trilogies in the past. But uh, yes, this is a beautiful edition, which we're going to talk about a little bit in this review. Guys, this is a book, uh, God, I think this is his 16th book written by Mr. Crystal, but it's the first one that I've tried. Now, I own the Nevernight Chronicle. I've just never gotten into it because I've always heard such mixed things. And I really started to wonder, is this a YA author? You know, a lot of the people who was recommending stuff to me, I was like, okay, well, you guys, I'm looking at like your good reads and stuff. I'm like, a lot of the stuff you guys read is not really particularly what I read. But Empire of the Vampire, this seems to be one that I just, I could not stop hearing about for the last, I mean, it came out in September and I just have not been able to stop hearing about it from everyone I know just about on BookTube was reading it and reviewing it. And I'm like, do I really need to review this? But you know what? I put this up for a poll. You guys said that you wanted me to read it. So, uh, hey, I'm going to give the people what they want here. So uh, I am officially probably like the 2,000th person to review this on BookTube. But I'm going to go ahead and give you my opinions on it. But uh, I'll admit that I did shrug this one off for a while because uh, I've said before, uh, the vampire genre has been pretty shaky the last two decades. So uh, I've always kind of just kind of, well, we'll see what happens here. But I've kind of been waiting, I think, for a book like this. And we're going to talk about why. I almost forgot before I get started, I want to thank Ryan, one of my patrons, and also Mark from Slowly Read for being the two gentlemen who finally put me over the edge and made me believe this was something that I was going to enjoy. So uh, check out uh, Slowly Read's channel. I'll link in the description below. He has a really, really great review of this book up. Okay, so let's get into it, guys, with what is this book about. Now, it has been 27 long years since the last sunrise. For nearly three decades, vampires have waged war against humanity, building their eternal empire even as they tear down our own. Now only a few sparks of light endure in a sea of darkness. Gabriel de Leon is a silver saint, a member of a holy brotherhood dedicated to defending the realm and church from the creatures of the night. But even the silver order could not stem the tide once daylight failed us, and now only Gabriel remains. Imprisoned by the very monsters he vowed to destroy, the last Silver Saint is forced to tell his story. A story of legendary battles and forbidden love, of faith lost and friendships won, of the wars of blood and the Forever King, and the quest for humanity's last remaining hope, the Holy Grail. Yes, that one, guys. That takes us into 2021's The Empire of the Vampire. Now, what do we usually do? We usually begin with what makes it good or bad. Let's continue to keep that format. I want to start with the good because, guys, this book has a lot of it, a lot of good stuff. I have been waiting for this, guys. An adult vampire story. It has been so, so long, it feels like. 
I don't know if I would kind of put this in the grimdark category, but I started thinking about it. I was like, well, why? He's got a cruel and punishing world. He's got morally gray characters, especially a lead character. Uh, he has character deaths nonstop. Uh, so I was like, really, what is really uh, making this not fall on the grimdark category? Which, you know, that's an argument we're never going to stop having. Uh, but yeah, I would say I don't see very many difference from it in some of the most grimdark things that I've ever read before. So uh, yeah, I'll say that. But look, guys, this feels fresh, but somehow familiar. And I think it's because there is a lot of interview with the vampire in here. There is a lot of vampire the stat. There is a lot of Salem's Lot. Those kind of things. Maybe Blaze. Some other vampire stories that you feel might be kind of familiar. And I think it's clearly obvious that Mr. Kristoff does kind of wear these influences on his sleeve. But it never feels like a way it's like, oh, well, I've heard this before. No, it feels it feels familiar, but it feels very, very fresh. He's definitely putting his own spin on some of these things. So it's uh, you can tell there's some things that obviously he was influenced an, under. And uh, I, me as an Anne Rice devotee, I'm never going to be mad about that. So uh, again, guys, I have been waiting for an adult vampire story for 20 years now. And it's finally happening. So uh, I got to say that is, is the best. And oh my God, guys, the dialogue in this book is just straight fire. I mean, it's so snappy. It's so good. It's witty. It never takes you out of the story. It's like, who would say that during this time period kind of thing? It never feels like that. The things that they say, you can see people actually saying it to one another, but it also never feels like, doth the protest. You know, you do have a loss. You do have some of that because some of these vampires are really, really ancient. And I do like that, that they do kind of talk like that, especially the villains in this kind of talk that way. Really, really well done. But I bet I bet our main cast here, you know, you don't have to worry about anything like that. It feels uh, modern, but not ever where they're not going to be like, yo, what's up, fam? You know, not going to worry about stuff like that. Like I see you can get in some uh, what I would call YA paranormal teen romance, you know, but this definitely does not fall on that guy's very, very adult story. I think it really begins with his dialogue. Uh, uh, something is, is this story is being told, uh, much like a, a Name of the Wind or a Sun Eater by Chris Rocky, where uh, it is our, our main protagonist is telling us his life story kind of thing. And what makes this one a little different for me is that he's telling it uh, not in sequential order. Now, that's something that's always kind of been iffy to me, but I feel like it's done really, really well here. We have three main timelines. Uh, you have the present day where he is reciting his story to a historian. Let's leave it at that. I don't want to get too spoilery for you here. And then we do deal with him uh, as a beginning as a, as a young teenager into his uh, time as an initiate. And then you jump ahead like 20 years soon in his 30s where he's dealing with basically this main quest line. And he bounces back and forth between those. And the reason that he does this is because if he revealed everything in sequential order, some of those big shockers in the second storyline, second timeline would not be as impactful. So I think it's done brilliantly here. I love the way he actually uh, seamlessly can go in between talking to the historian and not quite talking to the reader, but telling his story in a way that feels like, okay, if he was telling the story to another person, I think that this is exactly how he would do it. Going back and forth between that real-time conversation and then the conversation in those flashbacks done really, really well. There's never once where I'm like, wait, is this actually happening? Because there has been stories like this where I'm like, I don't know if this is happening now or if this was happening then. He does a good job at doing that. And uh, it, we're getting to uh, the, the not so good part, something that might actually bother you about the way that that's done. But I, I think it's really great. And guys, I talk about the dialogue. I got to talk about the swearing, what I kind of joked about in the opening there. Look, Jay Kristoff's swearing ability is next level. Everyone else is competing for second place. I say there's a Joe Abercrombie guy. This man's, uh, his swearing, like his combinations, his modifiers for the ways, the terms that he comes up with, amazing. Amazing talent. Like, I mean, <laughs> I think my, my, my redheaded wife who curses like a sailor, uh, she would be like, wow, that's that's something. Uh, I actually had to recite some of these to her because they were so good. She she kind of laughed at one where you basically call someone like a cum rag, which is just, you might not think is that good, but the way he says, he says it more, you know, <laughs> deli not really delicately, but he's a, a better wordsmith than I am. But God, guys, it's just, it's so good. Uh, I, I mean, it's just so many times. I, it made me think of uh, the one of the things I really liked about Liza Lachlan-Moore is Scott Lynch was very good at this as well. Because uh, I said, with the problems I have with Liza Lachlan-Moore, it was never the dialogue. This dialogue really reminds me of that. And less in a buddy cop kind of way and more of just, you know, the, 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 the insults in this are really, really just top-notch. And 
I can't. I don't really want to ruin any of them for you, but just know that uh, uh, Twat Goblin and uh, and and fuck my face have become just like regular phrases that I'm using in my everyday life now, and I'm just so proud of that. But again, uh, that talent. Uh, if you are in for something like that, and me reading lots of Joe Abercrombie, like I said. Uh, Stephen King. I'm here for uh, all of the bad language because I'm just a deviant that way, guys. And I love that Mr. Kristoff seems to be too because it really made me relate to these characters a little bit. Now, one thing about a written word book that you'll never really hear me say is, you know, you'd always be like, hey, this was the first book that I read that didn't have pictures in it. I say that about The Hobbit all the time. Uh, this book has illustrations in it by Ben Bon Orthwick. Orthwick. Bon Orthwick is his name. The illustrations in here are magnificent. This cover is easily, hands down, the best cover of the year. I'm sorry, Mr. John Gwynn. I love you to death, and I thought Shadow of the Gods was amazing. This beats it. This is just so, so cool. And the thing is, guys, is the United States version of this cover, not that great. Not that great. In fact, that's the kind of thing I know that chased a lot of people off when you got a shirtless vampire on the front with a sword with tattoos all over. It's like, hmm, I wonder if this is in the paranormal teen romance section, but this cover right here is just amazing and guys uh the, the the illustrations aside i'm not going to show them to you because i want you to buy it and i want you to look at them i don't want to give them to you for free but there are some really really great great illustrations and they're not the hyper realistic illustrations like you would get in something usually in epic fantasy they look animated almost in like a castlevania on netflix kind of way so i think that's just kick ass because i do love me some castlevania guys in fact you get a lot of castlevania vibes while you are reading this book and that's a I think that's a great compliment because that's a series. I, I'm talking about the games, guys. That's a series that I love. And, of course, the Netflix series. I talked about him being able to flip seamlessly between these timelines. And I think what he does is he gives you little tiny pieces of his mysteries in his book. And enough to give you hooks to want to know what's going. Enough to have the wheels turning where you're thinking, oh, okay. I think this is how, like, the whole time, like, I think this is what is going on with his family and things like that. And you have these ideas the whole time. And when they're revealed to you, are like, Oh, okay, I get it now, but he does it perfect. He has perfect timing with this. He never gets to a point where you're just like frustrated. This isn't like Ross and Rachel on like season nine of Friends here. You're never in that point where you're like, okay, get on with answering these clues here. You didn't think I'd use a Friends reference in this, did you? Just wild like that. But when they happen, guys, it's so, so satisfying. And I think, again, he just plants so many good hooks for the future. There's a lot of things that don't get answered in this. There's a lot of questions I've been asked is, can it work as a standalone? Look, it has a close-off ending. It does. But you don't get answers to everything. And what I try to tell people, that's not a plot hole. That's called something to speculate upon that can be answered in a sequel. I don't know when that started being called plot holes. They're not plot holes, guys. They are they are hooks to get you to read the sequels, and they're done very, very well, just like his villains are. His villains in this are done very well. The Voss family is just spooky. And I mean, uh, if I want to be honest about it, uh, some of the people in his own brotherhood are pretty villainous, just, uh, so to speak. But the villains in this, look, you got this guy, the Forever King. He's like the big bad. And he's just like this, this ominous presence in the background the whole time. You always hear about it. And I actually like started speculating, huh? I, you know, you're not actually using his name. I wonder if this is like someone we have known, you know, we're knowing in the past. I'm like, that's kind of like the way the mysteries I was talking about that I was kind of thinking while reading this. I'll just say that when the Forever King actually shows himself on page, it is one of the most tense and amazing chapters I've read all year, guys. The dialogue in that scene is so good. It almost felt like Kurt Barlow from uh, uh, Salem's Lot by Stephen King. That's the presence that this guy brought. In the one time he appears in this book, it is so good. It is an incredible chapter. I was on pins and needles, and it just, it was soul crushing let's put it that way guys but it's so good it's so good i think that's again that might be one of the best chapters i've read single chapters i've read all year and i've read some really banging malazan ones this year that's how good it is so uh, i think that he did a great build for that moment and then when it happens the payoff is so good even if it isn't exactly what you want to happen here. I mean, look, uh, if you look on Mr. Kristoff's, uh, his, uh, I believe it's his Goodread page or it might be his website, uh, in his little bio section, it does say he doesn't believe in happy endings. So I'll just leave you guys with that. But look, the action is exciting. It's brutal. It's well-written. It's very descriptive. So are those, those are the kind of things that bother you. That's why I said I can't see why I wouldn't call this Grimdark because he will tell you how the sausage gets made, but uh, you can't uh, call Kristoff soft on his characters. That's the biggest thing here. The body count is unusually high. And uh, a lot of book ones, when this happens, I'll complain about it in this, this subgenre, is that, okay, 
I feel like you're just killing characters off so you can say, I got a high body count. Look how dark I am, right? I don't really think that's the case here because he does a good job of making you care about these characters. Where you say, how does he do that in one book one? Look how big this book is, guys. It's this big for a reason. I'm a character first guy. He develops these characters really, really well in both timelines. So when they get killed off, it hurts, guys, because you've actually formed a bond with them because he develops them very well. So if his character work is this great, I'm going to enjoy going back and reading Mr. Kristoff's back catalog that I haven't gotten to yet. I got a lot. It's like finding Blake Crouch and going backwards. I think I'm going to do this with Mr. Kristoff now. So I'm very, very excited about that. And I've got to give credit where credit is due, guys. I constantly rail on this channel about male fantasy authors not realizing that it is not their forte to write a sex scene. And it usually is just so, so cringe. Just about every modern fantasy author is so bad at this. And it's just like, why are you doing this? You don't know what you're doing. Jay Kristoff knows what he's doing, guys. There's some steamy scenes in this. And there are a couple that I was kind of like, <laughs> well. Uh, so uh, credit again where credit is due. Uh, I know a lot of people like me have gotten to the point where we don't even want that in the book because it's usually just so awful to try and read. It's really good. That's all I'll say. I don't. I don't know if this man worked in uh, some uh, some Harlequin romance first or what. But you know, I have some experience on this channel with Harlequin romance. If you want to look that up, that's don't make a bet with your wife, guys, because uh, you're gonna lose and she's gonna make you pay for it. But let's get into some of the uh, not so good things now, guys. These are gonna be subjective. I didn't necessarily have very many problems with this book, but there are some things I think that uh, I will need to bring up to you here. The writing style might be confusing for some people because this book is almost 90% quotes, dialogue. Uh, so that might confuse me because you're not only are you having this gentleman tell his story to someone else, but when he's telling the story, he's reciting the dialogue from that story. So uh, a couple times that might be like, I wait a second, you know, why are there like double quotes here and things like that? It's stuff that you, you get used to. It isn't like on a Cormac McCarthy level of trying to get used to how an author is writing. I just think that might be jarring for some people. By chapter two, I was fine with it. And at first, I was like, whoa, what is this? So uh, I think that may be something that uh, it's a little rough to get into, but I don't think it's going to much too bad. The multiple timelines may confuse some people. Uh, like I said, you start with this first timeline, which is when he's a teenager, and then you have kind of like your intermission that you always have, and then you go to the next part of the story, and all of a sudden, he's in his 30s, and it does that Malazan thing. It just drops you in a situation. You don't know what's going on or whatever. Just keep reading, guys. It'll make sense uh, because, you know, he will do that and then he'll introduce you to like five to six new characters. You're like, wait, what's going on? Give it time. It'll get there. Like I said, very, very good character work. So you're going to understand who all these characters are and things like that. But at first, it may seem jarring. My only advice, keep going. It'll make sense over time. A word that I keep hearing a bunch of younger booktubers use, and look, I'm not going to pretend I understand everything uh, that, that, that the young crowd uses. They keep using this phrase, edgelord, a lot. And some of the criticism I'm hearing is that Gabriel, oh my God, he's such an edge lord. Look, I don't even pretend to understand exactly what that means, uh, but I think I do. So uh, I'm not going to get too much into that. Let's just say, guys, I love Berserk by Kentaro Miura. And uh, Guts, uh, he sounds like he fits that definition. And uh, I love the character. So I guess it just doesn't bother me as much as it bothers some people. Um, yeah, uh, badass dude. They can swing a sword. Um, I'm, it's not, I'm not very hard to please in that regard. And, and uh, the sex and the violence and the, and the swearing, if that's something you aren't really into, uh, yeah, you might want to give this one a pass. Um, that, I mean, if you are like me, you've been waiting for a really good vampire book for a while, uh, you, you can't, you're not going to deal with vampires and like, there are going to be no sex and no violence. I mean, that's just, kind of goes hand in hand here. And you know, one last good thing before I go into why you should read it, the romance is actually pretty good in here. I've had people ask, is this a romance book? There is a romance in it and it's done, developed very, very well, but I wouldn't call this a romance book. All right, so let's go ahead and get into uh, why I think you guys should read it. Look, I have been waiting, like I said, for an adult author to come back and take the vampire genre back for adults. You know, because for a long time, long, long time, guys, this genre has felt like it has belonged to 15 to 35-year-old ladies, which is fine, guys. I just know that's not my target demo. It's nothing that I'm going to obviously enjoy. Vampire Chronicles went south in the late 90s there. It's been... One of those things where I'm like, I'm only carrying on with it because I've carried on this long. It hasn't been enjoyable for me for a long time because uh, even Anne Rice, 
you know, God bless her. I think she's one of the greatest ever. But even she kind of fell into that trap of what I always talk about, uh, making vampires sexy before you make them scary. I think that uh, Mr. Kristoff's done a great job of making vampires scary as they should be. You know, I want to go back to those days of Salem's Law, those days of Dracula, things like that. Hell, even Necroscope at this point. And I've only read one of those books, so I can't really put it in there. But I know someone would bring it up, so I wanted to bring up Necroscope. Uh, I just wanted the, the, the genre to get away from just YA paranormal teen romance because it almost made, because of that, it almost made me, someone like me, skip this book because of that preconceived notion. So um, if you're looking for an adult vampire book, guys, like I have been for a long time, uh, this is it. it your, your wish has been granted. It is here. But look, put your fears aside. This is not YA paranormal teen romance. This is brutal. This is really dark stuff. So I just want you to be prepared for that. And uh, I consider these all good things, guys. So uh, fast paced, snappy dialogue, great action, cruel and punishing world that I want to know more about. I want to know more about why the sun doesn't work anymore. All these questions that you have, uh, you will get them and more as you read this very, very good uh, mystery setup. Uh, like I said, payoff, but also not giving you all the answers, you know, having some things that you still want to know about. Now look, I hate the it's blank meets blank comparison. And I'm not going to say it's the Game of Thrones meets something else. That's everybody else's line. In fact, I actually railed on publishers for that recently uh, because on Nevernight Chronicle, it says fans of Game of Thrones and uh, Realm of the Elder Things will love this. And I'm like, man, you guys just don't even try anymore. It's always Game of Thrones and something, right? But with this, guys, gun to my head, you're going to make me do that. People have asked me, what kind of series is it like? Well, look, obviously the first thing I'm going to talk about is Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles. Now, it doesn't feel like that, but I say, imagine if Anne Rice was trying to write Castlevania with a little bit of Witcher in it because there is kind of that little um, Geralt and Ciri thing going on in this book, which I think is awesome. And if you don't know what that is because you haven't read The Witcher, that's okay. It's not going to ruin anything for you. But uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, like I said, it almost feels little Castlevania-ish. I love that about this. So uh, again, I think that that's the best way to describe it. I, I think... I, I don't know. I mean, he could say that Anne Rice isn't, he's never even read Anne, Loy, Anne Rice, so I can't say that's an influence from him. That's just the feelings that I get, is knowing Anne Rice, knowing Interview with a Vampire, knowing uh, the Vampire Lestat. I get a lot of that out of this, and uh, I just, I needed it. I needed that. So I think that's why it really, really worked for me, guys. That's why I think you should read it. But now I got some final thoughts here. Like I said, I've been waiting 20 years for this. Uh, vampire Chronicles has let me down for so long. I just, I quit trying vampire books a while back. Like I said, the genre just got hijacked and it didn't look like it was coming back. Uh, after the rise of Twilight, guys, it just even more. It was just like, forget about it. We've lost it. It's gone. Uh, and then we moved on to zombies. And I mean, well, I think that one's kind of still going on. But uh, look, I hope this means that the tide is turning. I'm hoping this means that authors and publishers realize there is a market out here for adult vampire fiction again i would love for that because i mean look guys i love vampires i do but they've gotten to the point where it's just like oh god are they in love with another high school girl you know it just it's it's been rough it's been really really rough so having this you know take place in like the time period that it does and again the way it is written is just modern but also like i said feels very very familiar and i think that that's just a great way of showing your uh, writing influences now i thought this was a spectacular book look 800 pages and it never felt slow to me i think that the, 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 he does that extra time to develop some characters and there's one part where i admit i was kind of like okay this is going on kind of long when i realized no he's building this bond between gabriel and this other main character and he does it really really great so it's one of those things like even after i finished i was like my opinion of that's going up even higher and look it doesn't really matter but that was my book of the month for november and it was totally unexpected because i didn't even expect to read this book and now it's like my book of the month and i read blake crouch that month and you guys know i'm really on board with blake crouch right now but uh yeah i enjoyed it so much guys i put in case you missed it when i talked about new series i'm starting i do have the nevernight chronicle on my tbr for 2022 and i've actually invited jay Kristoff to come to this channel onto the channel and he has graciously accepted don't know when that's going to happen we're still talking we're on a big big time gap He's in Australia. I'm in the States. I think there's a 14-hour gap between us, so our communication is very slow because he's basically getting up when uh, I'm in La La Land, and uh, basically uh, when I'm when I'm getting ready for lunch, he's getting ready for bed. So you know that's about that's about how it works with with Australia. But um, no, I might have those time zones mixed up. I, I don't know, guys. I don't pretend to understand how this works when you're three quarters of the world away. But I'm very excited to talk to him about this book and talk to him about uh, other things as well when that actually happens. But pick this book up, guys. I think. 
if one of those things that I mentioned above don't bother you, this book is going to just be a grand slam for you. And I can't wait to talk to you about it. So guys, have you read Empire of the Vampire or any other Jay Kristoff? Drop in the comments and let me know what you think. And I will talk to you there.